Hey, just a heads up before we start, today's episode of Schmeitgeist is mainly about sex. So that's going to keep coming up. Also, some swearing. ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. So there's a new kind of coming out video that is gracing social media. So after being in an open marriage and having a girlfriend for about a year now, we, me and my husband, decided that it was time to tell our children about our little dynamic. To be clear, this is a married couple with, like, Gen Z kids. And as discussed, they're open, maybe even polyamorous by some definitions. And what happens next may or may not shock you. And I told them, you know, Jackie is mommy's girlfriend. My youngest just all of a sudden goes, girlfriend, girlfriend, girlfriend. And my oldest just keeps continuing to get his hot dog. So we're like, okay, guys, like any questions, like, let us know. Do you understand? And finally, our oldest is like, I have a question. And I'm like, oh, no. So he goes, how did you get these strawberries? So juicy, mom. No meltdowns, no confusion. If anything, they're verging on indifference. Probably because ethical non-monogamy, or ENM if you're feeling cute, isn't really taboo anymore. At least not to most people under 40, or anyone who's on a dating app. I have a few friends that do it. No one's ever pitched it to you, no one's ever been like, Oh yeah, I've been pitched. <laughs> yeah. And what did you say? Um, well, it was who I was dating at the time, and I was like, yes, whatever you want. And I'm also bisexual, so I was like, yes. So is this the new normal? Now it's like, if you don't practice ethical non-monogamy, it's sort of like, ah, let's sleep with one person. That's so like retro, like good for you. I'm Angela Blapierre, and this is Schmeitgeist, the podcast from ABC Everyday that decodes the biggest and weirdest trends in pop culture, coming to you from Gadigal land. And in this episode, we want to know how ethical non-monogamy made its journey away from the fringes. The self-proclaimed witch, Morning Glory, they manufactured unicorns by, like, surgically manipulating the horns to grow into just one, like, horn in the centre of the head. So, what? Yeah. <laughs> and into the mainstream. It's not for weirdos. It's not necessarily for like super kinky people. It's just sort of what it is to be participating in love and sex today. What's it like to make the switch? I feel like I remain an unsuccessful polyamorous. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, it's really hard. It's really fucking hard. And is it here to stay? I think we'll all be dead before we have like a polyamorous prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> Long before that could ever happen. So I think it's fair to say that so far in this season of Schmeitgeist, we've been mainly dwelling in online rabbit holes, you know, like bimbo talk. But this episode is a bit different because ethical non-monogamy, by which I mean polyamory, open relationships, all of it, just feels much more immediate and real, at least in my world. For starters, and this is not how I planned to tell my parents, but here we are, I've been mostly in open or poly relationships for years. The best way I can explain it is to say that it's just something about how my brain is wired. It hasn't always been easy, but it is very much who I am. So yeah, I'm kind of living this one. But also, more and more people I know are experimenting with some version of ethical non-monogamy. It almost feels as if I looked up at some point, last year maybe, I don't know, and the majority of my friends were either doing it or thinking about doing it. And Googling it too. So Google searches for ENM and polyamory have been steadily increasing since before the pandemic. Basically, ethical non-monogamy as a whole just seems to be on people's radars like never before. I've seen much more of it around. He wanted to partner with another girl and I was like, yes, I'd be there for it. I'm certainly seeing the phrase a lot more often, yeah. Like, would you ever do it? On, on paper, yes. In practice, it seems kind of difficult. <laughs> My last two relationships were open relationships, so I feel fairly well-versed in the idea. But I think it's hard to find one person who can fulfil all of your sexual needs. I think everyone's becoming more curious, and I think the more normal that it becomes, probably the more prevalent it will become because people will stop feeling so judged. 
And look, full disclosure, we recorded those interviews in the Sydney suburb of Newtown, which is kind of cheating because Newtown has got to be one of the most polypilled locations in Australia. And I have no doubt I would have heard different answers if I'd asked the same question in another postcode. But just in general, e and and polyamory are more visible now on social media, in memes, in film and TV plot lines, even among celebrities. So this is Willow Smith. Oh, and the other voice you can hear is her mum, Jada Pinkett Smith. How did you feel when I told you that I was polyamorous? When you were like, hey, this is my get down, I was like, I totally get it. I think anything goes as long as the intentions are clear. You know it, what I mean? To everyone. Yeah. Most people right. are practicing monogamy because they feel like they have no other choice. Right. We all know that most people out here do an unethical non-monogamy right. any unethical. damn way. You can also see it in dating app bios. There are even dating apps that have cropped up specifically to cater to an ENM market, Field being one example. And look. We don't know exactly how much more common it is because it is a tough one to measure for obvious reasons. Some studies in the US suggest around 11% of people have tried it out, but it hasn't really been reliably mapped in Australia at all. That said, I know I'm not hallucinating this one. So first we spoke to someone whose whole job it is to find out about other people's sex lives. I'm Alyssa Shalaski. I am the writer and columnist for Sex Diaries, which is New York Magazine's weekly column where I profile a different person's love and sex life every single week throughout the year. I've had the column for eight years, so that's a lot of strangers' sex I have been embedded myself in with. And I'm also the author of two books, Apron Anxiety, My Messy Affairs, In and Out of the Kitchen, which is basically about, about me fucking a bunch of different chefs and <laughs> not, not actually about anxiety at all. And then my most recent book is called This Might Be Too Personal. And it's uh, about my journey to becoming a single mother by choice. Um, and all of my sort of unconventional decisions in, uh, in love and relationships. With the chef book, did you like say that at the launch or did you have to pretend for a bit that it was actually about anxiety? <laughs> Neither. It actually started when I was engaged to a chef um, and it was supposed to be a long story where, with recipes where I sort yeah. of taught myself to cook in order to fit in. Um, into like his scene because he was a celebrity chef who had just starred on Top Chef on Bravo TV. And we had this really sort of glamorous chefy lifestyle. But mm. midway through writing the book, I left him because he was a chef. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I leave this to say it was not an easy relationship to navigate and ultimately was not the right relationship for me. It's interesting to talk about ethical non-monogamy with you here because that was that was almost 10 years ago. In hindsight, had I had that been in the culture, the concept of ethical non-monogamy, perhaps you could have made it work, but that was not on my radar yet whatsoever. So interesting to hear you, you know, say, oh, if only I'd known about ethical non-monogamy back then. I feel like uh, that's a conversation that I hear a lot. Maybe a good place to start is as someone with your eyes on, well, people's private lives, people's sex lives, when did you start to notice an increase in chatter about ethical non-monogamy? I mean, in all its different forms. I'll be honest, it might, it might shock you, but it was, it was only about three years ago. We started casting for the Sex Diaries docuseries and we were looking for real people who were willing to be filmed and I got at, uh, thousands of applicants. And the term uh, E, I'm, now I'm trying to think, so I, I need a, a third cup of coffee. E&M? E&M, and it's like ethical non-monogamy. I mean, it's like, oh, okay, I've kind of heard about that, but then I'm like Googling, but wait, what is that again? And like, is that polyamory? And is that open relationship? I mean, it's like, it is a bit confusing, right? And I just started asking questions. And this was only about three years ago. And then since then, I mean, it's just, now it's everywhere. Now it's like, if you don't practice ethical non-monogamy, it's sort of like, ah, you're monogamous? That's so rock star. <laughs> like, oh my God, you're, you only sleep with one person? That's so like retro, like good for you. Um, so it's sort of shifted. If you are going to go online and do online dating, you better be ready to talk to 
at least 50% or more people who say they're ethically non-monogamous or poly or whatever. So like Alyssa said, she's noticed a big increase in mentions of poly and ENM more generally in the last few years. Also, a kind of mainstreaming effect, like shockingly mainstream. It's not necessarily for like super kinky people. It's just sort of what it is to be participating in love and sex today. And I find that it's sort of like friends who are in their 30s, 40s, 50s who are committed or have kids or are sort of settling down or settle down at this point in my life are on one of two paths. They're monogamous and struggling with it, either having affairs or wondering if their partner's having an affair or dreaming or fantasizing about having an affair, or they're practicing some form of ethical non-monogamy where You know, it's not without its own complications and burdens, and there's a lot of talking and processing, and not everybody has the bandwidth for that either. But they're probably in a healthier place because there's no secrets, and secrets make you sick. And I think we're we're all starting to catch on to that at this point. You know, I had lunch with a work colleague who is a 60-year-old married man, and I'm pretty sure he's a registered Republican. And we were talking about my relationship. And I said, we've had a rough year. It's been very stressful. We've had, you know, we're stressed. We have financial stresses. We have kids stuff, this and that. And he said, have you thought about opening things up? I was like, wow, honey, wow. And he wasn't being a scumbag. And I mean, it was no different from him saying like, did you get your life insurance policy yet? Like, it was just like a very normal question. I also think it's very funny advice to give to a sex columnist where you're like, oh, okay, thank you. Did you take out your pen and like write it down? <laughs> totally. But what I did take away from it was not like, yeah, it's like, yeah, obviously I've thought a million times about opening my relationship <laughs> up. But I, what I took from it was just like, how cool is this? Like, that this mm. is like, there, this is a scandal-free conversation right now, like talking about sleeping with people that aren't our primary partners. So yeah, it's out there. That much we know. But what it's like up close is a whole other story, which is why I was actually thrilled. Like, not in the throwaway way that people sometimes use that word to interview Sally Olds. Uh, My name's Sally Olds. I'm a writer. Um, I live in Nam at the moment, Um, although I grew up in regional Queensland in a town called Maribor and I lived in Brisbane for a while. And I write mostly nonfiction. I released a book of essays last September called People Who Lunch. So her essays cover a lot of territory. She's written about the generational mood for dropping out of work, which we're also talking about a bunch this season. There's one on the bizarre history of this legendary queer club in Melbourne called Hugs and Kisses. And she also writes in depth about the experience of being Polly. This is potentially quite an unconventional way to start an interview. Mm. (laughs) But I'm only asking you because I think it's relevant in quite a big way. You were really hesitant to do this interview when I first approached you. Why is that? Why do you think you were hesitant? Yeah, for a start, the the poly stuff in the book is the most personal and um, I want to quarantine it within the covers of the book a little Mm. bit and, yeah, not let it, like, be released and sort of, like, take over my identity so that I become, like, a poly person, (laughs) at least in the public's eye or whatever amount of the the public's eye I get, which is not very much. But (laughs) I didn't, yeah, I didn't want to become a poly guy, I guess. Yeah, I can almost, like, I can see the inverted commas that you're putting around poly guy. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> when when you say it. And when I was researching this interview, what popped into my head was this 2019 meme, which is, are you familiar with um, the eat hot chip and lie meme? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And like a, a typical formulation of this meme for the uninitiated, which was, you know, it was initially posted sincerely, obviously, as most of these things are, and then repeated exhaustively as parody. Uh, mm. And a typical formulation might go, any female born up to 1993 <laughs> can't cook. All they know is charge their phone, twerk, be bisexual, <laughs> eat hot chip and lie. And the reason that I thought of that is because I feel like the 2023 version of that meme, like you could sub out bisexuality and put in polyamory. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you see polyamory being understood in the mainstream imagination? Yeah, I don't know how much access I have to the mainstream (laughs) imagination, to be honest, because I think I'm extremely in a bubble Mm. where everyone is polyamorous and bisexual and 
eating hot chips. Um, <laughs> and lying. So, and lying, although yeah. that wouldn't be very ethical, ethically <laughs> non-monogamous. I don't know. I definitely think in the inner city Melbourne bubble, there is like a huge amount of people who are polyamorous. I don't know so much about the mainstream, but I do feel like it is shifting slightly into mainstream acceptance, whereas maybe 10 years ago, it was still pretty fringe. What do you think? Well, like there's almost like this daggy, embarrassing idea Mm. of the polyamorous cliche person, like this incredibly self-conscious, self-aware, performative, like there is this eye roll that accompanies it. Do you know the thing to which I refer? Yeah, the cringe. Mm. Um, Yeah, absolutely. And that's exactly probably part of why I don't want to be identified as that either because I can't help cringing about it, Um, even though at the same time it is (laughs) something I have practiced and something I'm interested in. I still can't shake the cringe. (laughs) I don't know. But yeah, absolutely. I, I do think the mainstream vision of it, it's either really hyperbolically sexy, like really kind of horny, like threesome mm. or throuple vibes, or it's really geeky. So I don't think there's much grappling with like the reality of it in the mainstream. What is a useful way, you know, if you're an alien who's dropped out of the sky <laughs> to uh, explain polyamory in a more nuanced way than that, I guess, cringe version mm. that people might have heard about first? Yeah, I think there's um, lots of different ways to practice polyamory. And um, yeah, as I say in the book, there's also heaps of related forms that might, you know, they're not exactly polyamory perhaps, but they're very much related and they get conflated, I think, with polyamory in the mainstream. So for instance, like being a swinger or being like polygamous gets conflated with being polyamorous. But I think polyamorous is is very much a kind of like secular way of arranging relationships. It is kind of happening outside of the state and outside of traditional religion. Polyamory is something that has had to like operate not in the mainstream because the mainstream is deeply calibrated for monogamy. And yeah, everything around us kind of reinforces that, um, including Centrelink. You can't really have a third partner with Centrelink. Um, I feel like when Centrelink recognises having like a third or fourth partner, like that's when polyamory will have truly been integrated (laughs) into the mainstream. Yeah, to get back to the definition, I think it generally like seen as a kind of practice of love, not just sex. It's seen as, you know, maintaining relationships with more than just one person. And it's usually implied that those are kind of intimate and they're not just kind of transactional sexual relationships as in maybe an open relationship, although they can be. But polyamory tends to have a focus on intimacy and kind of the longevity and seriousness of connections. And okay, so this is something that I didn't Mm. know before I read your essay. Where does the name come from? And is it like, tell me the story about a witch, Mm. a witch naming it in the the 90s. That was new information. I would love to tell you that story. (laughs) That's one of the best things I found out while writing the book was this story. So yeah, it comes from the self-proclaimed witch, Morning Glory, um, who was living in North America in the late 20th century. And she had many lovers. She yeah had a long-term lover named Oberon. And they lived on a kind of commune. She had a pamphlet that she would circulate every so often. And in this pamphlet, she first used the word polyamorous or polyamory from, I think, the Greek. And then that was the first instance that people know of, of the word polyamory coming into play. But she was really kooky. Like she and Oberon, they were, yeah, like a witch and wizard. And they manufactured unicorns by like surgically manipulating the horns <laughs> of goats um, to grow into just one like horn in the center of the head. So, what? yeah. <laughs> I feel like we've buried the lead here. Like, it's so hard to know what to mention about Morning Glory first that she absolutely uh, made unicorns or named polyamory. Yeah, she's a pioneer in many ways of of many things but um yeah are the goats are they are the goats okay I don't know um yeah don't know about that I would love to find out more okay um, TBC Peter. that's yeah. season three we <laughs> yeah up on the goats so just to recap the word itself was invented by a witch who Cronenberged a goat into a unicorn which is perfect in so many ways Not least of which because unicorn also happens to be the term for when a couple finds the perfect person to make them a thruple. And we wonder where the cringe comes from. 
But you know what? I am grateful for it in a roundabout way. Mortified, but also grateful, because it's that cringe and the fact that monogamy is seen as this default setting that made Sally want to write about polyamory in the first place. I got pretty pissed off at the laziness with which um, people tend to think about things like polyamory or monogamy or sex or love. Yeah, I just found that it was totally lacking, like, this stuff I'd encountered. And I guess that's where that sense of anger comes from. And maybe it was, maybe it's not so much anger as, like, a sense of urgency mm. and and purpose as well. I mean, you mentioned that there is a bit of a cliche, maybe the piece of writing that's like, I tried poly and it didn't mm. work. And I think that's really satisfying for a lot of people in the mainstream who may maybe are monogamous and, you know, want to be confirmed in that mm. because it's sort of a repudiation of that mm. choice. Whereas you write about the end of a poly relationship, I don't want to say failure, uh, mm. but you write about the end of that relationship and yet you're, I mean, the whole point is that you're kind of recommitting to it. Yeah, I feel like I remain an unsuccessful polyamorous. <laughs> like, I, <laughs> it's really hard. It's really fucking hard. And, uh, you know, the emotional part of it is difficult. And I honestly just don't know really how people do it um, and succeed at it. And pretty much every poly person I know, and I know a lot of them struggle a lot with it, but remain committed to it in some way. So I feel like, yeah, in practice, I'm flagging, but in theory, yeah, I do. I have this orientation towards it and weird commitment towards it, even though I do find it quite difficult in practice. So I'm actually also poly and mm. I think I was before I knew I was. Mm. I just sort of like stumbled into those relationships and mm. maybe did it badly for years. And I guess what I mean by that is inadvertently hurt people because, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't have a, a guidebook. But that label was, I don't know, it felt too extreme to call myself mm. that. I just felt like I was doing me to use the parlance of the times. That's really interesting. Just like um, I kind of forget about the people who gravitated towards polyamory just because they did sometimes because I'm not that person. And I think that's really interesting because people do have, yeah, that's like, I think a good distinction between like orientation and identity is like, I feel like I have an orientation towards it that is cultivated, but like, I wouldn't say that I am polyamorous at all in my identity. But yeah, I find it fascinating when, when people are just like, I just am poly like that's just how I operate and that's that's how I work I think if you're like a mm. person in the world who says you know like owns up to being poly you will cop remarks well-meaning remarks mm. from people who will say like oh I could never because it's you know, oh, I would get too jealous or it sounds too hard or like, you know, good mm. for you, but it's just not for me, which is like a well-meaning statement, but you end up defending yourself often from, and, and and I think the queer community is very familiar with this, particularly in the run-up to winning the right yeah. to marry, which is that you end up sort of blandifying yourself or as you say in the book, polyamory has often tried to banalify itself, mm. um, <laughs> which is a great new word. And yeah. yeah, I just wanted you to explain what you meant by that and maybe what the hazards are of that. Yeah, I think you did a pretty good job just then. But um, <laughs> yeah, to expand on that, the same sex marriage thing is a really good example. Yeah, you make yourself like palatable to the mainstream and you tone down like the wild edges in order to be accepted and to make it just seem normal and unthreatening. When you do that, like firstly, that takes up all of your energy and it's just a way of wasting your time. And secondly, I think when you do that, you lose like what is important about these things, which is precisely that they are uncomfortable and like rub up on the edges of social institutions or things that aren't really working in society for a lot of people. And it's like, yeah, what happens to these forms that were once radical when they are forced to spruik themselves, to sell themselves to the mainstream? You probably guess by the way I'm talking that I think that things shouldn't do that. Things shouldn't banalify themselves, which I didn't realize was a made up word. But now I'm like, yeah, that, that is a made up word. <laughs> but when I wrote it, I was like, that's a real word. <laughs> So 
So the other big thing we try to do in every episode of Schmeitgeist, apart from talking about the size and shape of a trend, is to work out what's driving it. Like why now, at this specific moment in history, is ethical non-monogamy taking off? I think it's due to probably a bunch of things, but I think like queerness is a big one. Obviously, like there's a huge intersection between polyamorous people and queer people. You know, Gen Z seems to be like queerer than ever. Mm. So I'm I'm sure there's like a, a huge overlap there. But I also, yeah, something I explore in the book a lot is its relationship to capitalism and to work. And one hypothesis I suppose I have in the book is that, you know, our precarious kind of overworked lives kind of go hand in hand with a form of relationship that is less rigid and less built around the kind of like monogamous couple, nine to five kind of lifestyle. Because, mm. you know, if our if our lives are changing so dramatically in terms of the way we spend most of them, really, like if we're not going to work from nine to five, five days a week, like what happens to our relationships? I think there has to be a link there. There's like a disintegration of the traditional working life. And I'm not going to say disintegration because that sounds like it's a bad thing, <laughs> but you know, there's yeah. like a, a change. There's a change in the way people conduct their relationship. I've also wondered if it could be an extension of a kind of anti-authoritarian streak mm. that is really prevalent in millennials, but more so in, in Gen Z, where there's like, and this is of the times as well, rather than just being generational, but um, like a mistrust of institutions mm. and um, traditional vestiges of power and I guess more of a willingness to consider um, upending things. Mm. That feels like the historical moment that we're in. And so that seemed to create a natural environment for people to consider challenging monogamy mm. as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think about um, like crypto in relationship to polyamory quite a lot. Mm. Um, and that's obviously part of my book too. Because, yeah, you're, I think you're right. It's like the moment we're in is this disruption and attempt to like reconstitute or bypass traditional value systems like marriage and yeah if you think of something like crypto it's all about like cutting out the the middleman of the state and I think that attitude really spans through things like polyamory where there is a kind of distrust of institutions like the church and and state as well mm. people don't want them interfering in their their personal lives So I find it genuinely hard to say what happens next to the ethical non-monogamy trend. And polyamory specifically is even harder to predict. Because like we keep saying, this is not for everyone. So maybe there's a natural ceiling on how many people will ever take it up. On the other hand, Alyssa Shalaski, New York Magazine sex columnist who we were speaking to at the start of this episode, sees it as part of a bigger pattern, like a fundamental change in how we approach sexuality. I think that this is not a trend that will go away. I think this is a shift, a huge cultural shift in um, the way we talk and think about sex. And I think that it's just the beginning. Like, I, I think that this is going to be the next, like, are you married or single or do you have kids or not? Are you, like, I just think it's just rising to the mainstream rapidly. Yeah, I guess that's the other thing. And you touched on this already, so I feel like I know which way you're going to go. But this gets talked about as a trend. But the thing about trends is that trends come and go. And I don't know that it's really fair to call ethical non-monogamy a trend in that respect in that this feels like toothpaste that doesn't go back in a tube. Oh, yeah, because it makes so much sense. What I consider myself is that I'm ethically non-monogamous in theory, but I'm monogamous in practice for right now, for today in this relationship. And I think that's the other part is like this concept of like fluidity, that we're all somewhere on a spectrum um, of gender, of sexuality, of monogamy, and it moves and it shifts. There's a reason in the season for all of it. And I think as we have those conversations, that's also going to rub off on how, where we fall in monogamy and it's nothing is fixed, nothing is permanent and then it should ebb and flow. No, I think that's a really great insight because that whole kind of spectrum paradigm, we didn't talk that way five years ago, whereas now that's kind of the only way we talk. You know, it's just a series of axes that are spectrums, whether that's gender, sexuality, you know, all these things. 
Yeah. Straight inside. I mean, I've only been with men my whole life, but I consider myself straight edge. Like, I think that's where we're all probably going to land if we want to be have happy and healthy and non-toxic relationships. What do you think? Like, is it just mm. having a moment and this is going to drop off or I don't know. Are you brave enough to make predictions? Um, I love to make a rash prediction. <laughs> Look, I think it's a really hard one because on the one hand, I could see polyamory gaining kind of just currency in the mainstream. I could see like dating shows <laughs> incorporating mm. polyamory, which, you know, it's like we have three bachelors, you know, it's like a little bit poly. <laughs> and, <laughs> like, That's a take. I love like, it. Like unwittingly poly. <laughs> um, I could see it getting kind of like mainstream adoption slowly but I could also see it just kind of like puttering along forever kind of below the surface with lots of people doing it but not much changing outwardly I think we'll all be dead before we have like a polyamorous prime minister (laughs) long before that could ever happen but I could see like for instance like lobby groups emerging the same way that you know happened for same-sex marriage and Mm. you know like interesting developments like that I feel like could happen but that will be a strange and slightly sad reality. I think I'm much more into the kind of trajectory that we've been talking about where it's kind of communist queers um, <laughs> <laughs> doing weird things <laughs> to, to goats. That sounds really wrong. but <laughs> <laughs> In dark corners and being written about in obscure histories. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. She really sells it. Not that banalifying polyamory wouldn't have its perks. I mean... I would like to be able to tell my parents without having to worry that I'm slutting up the conversation so badly that I can never again make eye contact. But also, maybe it is weird. And maybe that's fine. Or good even. And in the meantime, there's always the option of coming out on your own podcast. Next week's episode of Schmeitgeist is part one of a two-part investigation into the ADHD wave. You know, the thing where we all diagnosed ourselves on social media. I know it wasn't just me. Anyway, I did go and get a formal diagnosis, but it was such an expensive and complicated nightmare that I started to look into it. And long story short, there was so much wrong here that we decided to do two episodes. We're going to talk about the diagnosis boom, the internet culture that's feeding it, and the ensuing access crisis in Australia's mental health system, which means it's just about impossible to see a psychiatrist at the moment. That's next week, so make sure you subscribe on the ABC Listen app. Schmeitgeist is made by me, Ange Lavoie-Pierre, our excellent sound designer and producer Grant Walter and co-producer Elsa Silberstein for ABC Every Day. Thanks for being here and we'll see you next time. You've been listening to an ABC podcast. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.